On today's episode of You Asked, how does brightness and tone mapping affect SDR content? Or does it? Aren't all Blu-ray players basically the same? What's the difference between mini LED and micro LED? And when is TCL's monstrous 115 inch 5,000 nit TV gonna make its debut? Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison and this is You Asked, the show where I answer questions you asked in hopes that I can help you and others who have similar tech questions. If you've got a question for me, please send it to youasked at digitaltrends.com and we'll see if your question gets picked to be answered on the show. We're gonna jump right into it today with a question from James Barrett who writes, is tone mapping turned on by default or do we have to manually adjust this to create optimum brightness according to the ambient lighting in the same room as the LG TV. And coming in with a question along the same lines was Christian Brind Amor who wrote, regarding your TV brightness episode and tone mapping. Very informative, thanks. How does this apply to regular or cable TV? It seems you are only bringing up HDR type content. James and Christian, I'm glad you asked. Now, for those of you who haven't seen it, I did this video, which you can watch by clicking this up here, about TV brightness, the knit wars, and why it seems like TVs are just going crazy trying to one-up each other with how bright they can get. There were a few things I wish I had fit into that video, like the fact that double the knits does not equal double the brightness. And there were some more technical aspects, which Christian's question brings up. Tone mapping, which in short is the process by which a TV executes brightness according to the instructions it is given, is a process related to handling HDR content. So for regular TV and cable, most of which is in SDR, then tone mapping doesn't really apply. The TV will never get instructions for brightness that exceeds something like 200 nits for SDR content. Now with SDR content, you can turn the brightness of your TV up and down as you see fit and make the bright parts of the image as bright or dim as you like. With HDR, you don't get that option because the brightness or backlight setting is always going to be maxed out. You don't have the option to adjust the average picture level or average brightness, which is why some folks complain about HDR content being too dim. Tone mapping is just part and parcel of HDR, James, though there is static tone mapping, which means the TV does more or less what it's supposed to do or what it's told to do, or dynamic tone mapping, which means the TV does whatever the TV maker wants it to do with that content. I was talking to another YouTuber, Classy Tech Calibrations, AKA Classy, about this just the other day. HDR is mastered to be watched in a dark room, which means that some HDR content will appear to be too dim if you watch it in a sun-soaked room. Now, I have to go back on something I said earlier. In some cases, you can make HDR content brighter with a cheat on some TVs. Sometimes active tone mapping or dynamic HDR will just give you a brighter overall image. On some TVs, you can select the brighter version of the HDR picture preset to make the overall picture brighter. Or in the case of Dolby Vision IQ, you can just use a TV's built-in light sensor to adjust the tone curve so that the brightness of the picture is optimized to look good depending on the brightness of your room. And in another surprising and somewhat odd move, it appears Vizio is building in a tone mapping slider on its TVs, which lets you adjust the overall brightness of HDR content up or down. That's an interesting move. Anyway, I hope that extension of the brightness video is helpful and Christian and James, I appreciate you prompting me to get into that stuff with your questions. Next question comes from someone whose name I am going to butcher and I apologize wholeheartedly in advance. I am so sorry. Anyway, Yimmy Yugu writes, why are there good and bad Blu-ray players? I thought it was just a digital signal sent digitally to the TV. So I get where this question comes from. I too once thought that part of what makes a digital format or a digital signal so great is that it's just ones and zeros and it either gets from one place to another or it doesn't and there's no in between. 
That being the case, there'd be no need for premium HDMI cables, no need for premium digital audio players, no need for premium Blu-ray players. Like the digital video and digital audio revolution somehow was gonna be this great equalizer, right? It's as simple and straightforward as black or white, yes or no, one or zero. No gray area, no more voodoo, just goodness. Unfortunately, some of us got the wrong idea. I think I started learning this lesson when I started to learn a little bit about how DACs, or digital to analog converters, actually work. I learned there was such a thing as a clock in a CD player. It's the part of a CD player that syncs up with a DAC and tells it exactly when to decode a signal. It essentially controls the rhythm of a CD player and not all of them are created equal. But we're talking about Blu-ray players here. And while the Blu-ray format reduced some of the variance in picture quality that we saw among DVD players before them, it didn't entirely eliminate variance. Ideally, every decoder, processor and upscaler built into a Blu-ray player would be of the same quality. And they wouldn't do anything to the signal, they just leave the only variable to be the display device. But we know that not to be the case. There is variance among them and thus variance in the signal that they put out. Not a ton, but it does exist. Subjectively, I can tell you that the image from the Magnetar Blu-ray player here looks better than the Blu-ray player built into the Sony PlayStation 5, but it is virtually indistinguishable from the Sony Blu-ray player I have on the bench. Now, objectively speaking, I lack the instruments to quantify those differences, but several folks were here when I did the AB comparison and they saw it too without my prompting. In a blind test, the Magnetar beat the PS5 every time. But the difference in video quality is probably the least important factor when you're talking about a premium Blu-ray player. The most important difference to me is build quality. Super cheap Blu-ray players have transports and motors that aren't built to last. They will likely die over time. Also, cheap Blu-ray players have cheap DACs that don't sound as good as premium players, so if you're using it for audio playback and using the analog outputs, that's another reason to buy a more premium player. Then there's the user interface, boot up time, load times, and a bunch of other touch points that make one Blu-ray player more desirable than another. But yeah, the whole digital is digital and it is all the same thing doesn't hold water no matter what some blowhard in a forum tries to tell you. Without any dog in the fight, I've witnessed the differences myself time and again over the 28 or so years I've been at this. Power 5 writes, is mini LED the same as Samsung micro LED? These small size tech names are getting confusing. Okay, so mini LED and micro LED are different in terms of size and thus, how they get used. A mini LED bridges the gap between a conventional LED and micro LEDs. Conventional LEDs, you're probably familiar with what those look like, are always over 200 micrometers in size. Is it micrometers or micrometers? I don't know, let me know in the comments. I'm gonna go with micrometers. Mini LEDs, on the other hand, span 100 to 200 micrometers in size. And a micro LED must be under 100 micrometers. Now, this size difference is key because it determines how they can be used in a display. A mini LED is useful as a backlight for an LCD-based television. As we've discussed here before, since they are so much smaller than conventional LEDs, more of them can be packed into a space and they can be broken down into more tightly controlled dimming zones. That's the promise anyway. Depending on how they're used, sometimes, Mini LED TVs are better for having them, and sometimes they aren't much better than TVs with normal sized LEDs. Mini LEDs though are not tiny enough to be grouped together to represent a single pixel in a conventional sized television. Micro LEDs though are, or at least they can be. A pixel on a TV needs to be able to produce red, green, and blue. Micro LEDs are so tiny that a red, green, and blue micro LED can be shoved in the space of just one pixel. Now, it took a while for micro LEDs to be scaled down so that they were tiny enough to be in, say, a 65 inch display. But they have now, and Samsung showed us that at CES recently. 
Finally, one I've been saving for the end here. Ian writes, it has been quite a while, August 30th, 2023, since you covered the new TCL X955 TV. You mentioned it again in your CES 2024 coverage, but there was little new technical or sales information. I am yet to see any shipping information for this TV, and I was wondering if you have any insights into what is happening with the availability of this TV. I'm located in Australia, so we are always late to the party. I've been waiting for reviews and availability as I'm considering the 85-inch X955 for my own home. I'm concerned that this new TV doesn't appear to have been shipped to any reviewers. Testing, reviews, or insights into the TV are not yet available. Given some of your observations and comments about the new Hisense TVs at CES, could TCL be tweaking the X955 specifications before release? Great question, Ian. I'm glad you asked. First off, do not be concerned. It is very common for TV brands to announce TVs several months in advance of their availability. I imagine that they enjoy building anticipation and demand as folks like us chew on that knowledge that it does exist, but we have to wait until we can finally buy them. Anyway, I can't tell you exactly when the TVs from TCL will be available, but I can offer some well-educated guesses. First, for anyone who may not have been following this, TCL Global made an announcement in late August 2023 that the X955 TV would be coming, a 5,000 nit TV, very exciting. Then, more recently at CES, just this past January 2024, TCL North America announced the QM89, a 115-inch 5,000-nit TV. Now, the X955 announced globally and the QM89 announced for North America are not exactly the same, but they are very close. Now, for those of us in North America, I can tell you that it is likely we will not hear more about the QM89 or any of TCL's other TVs until sometime in May. That's when I went to the TCL event in New York at which the 2023 lineup was shown and announced and I got my first impressions of the QM8 in all of its glorious sizes. And shortly after that, TCL's TV started hitting store shelves in mid-June. Now, I'm assuming the same will happen in 2024. New TCL TVs, at least in North America, coming in June with a sneak peek in May. I do not, however, know what the release window for Oceania might be, Ian, but I reckon it won't be too far off that timeline. Now, historically, big, ambitious TVs like the 115-inch QM89 have come out a bit later than the core TV lineup. We've seen this from several brands, and it's possible that that could happen here. But I have a very strong sort of clairvoyant vibe going here that the QM89 could be available in June as well, right alongside all the other TVs. Yep, it's true. We may not have to wait until later in the year for that super big, exciting TV. Wouldn't that be awesome? Anyway, if you want to see the first meaningful preview and first impressions of the QM89, Guess where you're gonna see it? Yep, right here. And that makes this a great time to say thanks as always for watching everyone. I really enjoyed doing this one for you. If you enjoyed it too, let me know in the comment section. Keep those you asked questions coming. Smash this video with a like, subscribe to see more. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, here's two other videos I think you might like. Yay! We did it, yay!